offering. Um, if you have a child that you plan on dedicating to the Lord today, uh, we'd like you to get your child and we will um, <laughs> dedicate them to this house and to the Lord. So I know we've got one little guy. We'll just wait for him right up here. This is a special time. Of course, I think everybody's kind of aware of Ezra. He kind of makes an impact. He is about to turn one. All right, so friends and family. And now what we're doing when we dedicate a child, uh, what we're really saying is that they are part of this household of faith. And so with that, that means that we stand behind mom and dad, and we kind of keep an eye on this little guy, and we pray for him. And, uh, and he's really part of our family now. And so that's what we're saying. And, and so when you're part of that house, then, then, you know, he's got a whole lot of aunts and uncles. And, and my children, my daughters will tell you, growing up in Page, they got away with zip. All right? And so we're here to support them. We're here to be wisdom for them when they need it. Uh, we're here to give counsel. And uh, we're here to support them through anything that may come their way. And so, so ladies and gentlemen, meet Ezra Green. <laughs> and so we would invite you to stretch out your hands in an attitude of blessing as we pray God's blessing over them and for God's uh, touch and anointing on their parents as they raise him in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. <laughs> if you could watch his expressions as I'm talking, it's just hysterical. <laughs> so, Father God, we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for, for Ezra, Lord God. We thank you for this beautiful and healthy little life. We pray that your spirit would rest upon him in glory, and Lord God, that he would hear your voice even at the tenderest young age. Lord God, that he would have ears to hear, that he would have eyes to see. Lord, that his words would speak your truth in accordance with your word. We pray for mom and for dad, Lord God, that they would know you and seek you wholeheartedly, that if they dedicate him to you, Lord God, that they would know when to hold tight and when to let go. Father God, that they would know when to look for you on his behalf. And Lord God, which would be every day, but also when, uh, when it's time to look out for him, when it's time to let go. Father God, we pray your peace would rest upon Ezra, but also on mom and dad as they raise him. Lord God, we pray that your glory would rest upon their house as they seek to make it a household of the Lord. Father God, we pray that they would put you before all things. Lord God, that they would love you above all others, and in doing so, that they will love their children better. And so, Father God, we thank you for the privilege of raising this young person together. And Lord God, we pray that we would be one unit, Lord God, for his benefit, but most importantly, for your kingdom's benefit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He, he was very solemn about this. He's very solemn about this. So he was concentrating on every word. <laughs> God bless you guys. Oh, no, he's perfect. <laughs> God bless you guys. Oh, it's really a pleasure to uh, introduce Scott to you. Uh, Scott grew up here in Page. And uh, I've really had the privilege of watching him come through high school and, uh, and come to serve the Lord. And uh, he and Crystal were high school sweethearts and uh, had the privilege of actually uh, of doing their wedding. And then I was, in the, and I was in the National Guard, and it just so happened that both of you guys were born on my drill weekend. So I was actually got to see you guys less than a day old. So... So, yeah, so it's kind of crazy. And, 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 and to do all that just to have you come up here, Jake, and out shoot me with my own gun was really kind of harsh. I just got to tell you. Um, but we had a great, great time. And, uh, and he's actually a really natural shot. So, so it was pretty amazing. So uh, I'm going to hand this over to Scott. I'll let you tell him where you've been because I'll be bragging. So you can do that. You can brag if you want. Okay. Well, all right, got gotcha. you. Yeah, it's so good to be here with you guys, as always. Uh, I have a little bit to share, and um, Manny, don't be worried. Bob told me that if I go over time, he's going to order out, so no, nobody else needs to worry. What's that? And pay, exactly, right. So he, he did. He told me that. So, <laughs> so there's something that has been on my heart, um, something that the Lord has been working 
working on me about it. I don't know if you guys remember a couple other times I've spoke. I was looking back at my notes, and I realized I kind of share some similar things. Um, and I realized that, like, especially even as we were worshiping, this idea of, of, um, of, um, of adoption and how this is so important to, to who we are and how we live out our faith. And that, it always goes back to that for me, our identity in Christ and the fact that we are adopted children of God. And so that's what, and that's how we fight the battle, knowing, coming from that place of knowing that we are his children, that nothing can take us out of that place. So from that foundation, I want to talk about the topic of suffering. And I want to give credit to my wife for most of this message, because what I, what I did is I sat down with her and I just said, what's it been like to be married to me for the last 17 years? <laughs> so if you guys want to really know about suffering, there will be a session afterwards, and Crystal will be there with you. Uh, no, but really, suffering is one of those things that we all go through right? on some level. We all go through difficult things. But somehow, I keep forgetting I have this clicker thing. Somehow, we, we, we're, we're, we become able to like kind of push it away. And, you know, I'm sorry to poke, poke fun at some cliches and stuff. Um, but we have these Christian cliches, right? And sorry, Al. God is good, right? All the time. We say these things, and these things aren't bad. But I want to poke fun at these things a little bit to to make a point that sometimes these things stand as gatekeepers in our lives and prevent us from going in and really experiencing the pain of suffering and really dealing with it how God wants us to deal with it. Probably my least favorite is this one, which I don't believe is biblical anyway, I've heard people say, God doesn't give more than we can handle. He must think I'm strong. No, I'm weak, right? And the sufferings that we go through reveal my weakness. They reveal that I need him. And that's where he wants to bring us. So I just wanna, I wanna call you guys to move past those, 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 those gatekeepers, move past those things that prevent you from entering into the suffering. And I want to focus on, as a foundation, like I said, the fact that we are adopted children of God. If you guys remember, in Isaiah 9, we just had Christmas a few months ago, and there's this passage, right, that says, uh, and unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And one of the names that he has is Everlasting Father. We can look back on this now and understand, like, the, the complexity of the Trinity and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the people that this was written to lived in, a patriarchal society. When they heard the word everlasting father, and it's talking about this coming Messiah, they knew the connection. And what that was, was that the the father in the Middle East is the source of identity and security in your life. It's so important that like in Egypt and many other Middle Eastern countries, you can't even adopt children. There's no adoption system. There's foster care, but actual legal adoption like we have here is not allowed. And it goes back to this importance of the the father. And this, if you adopt a child, they could possibly bring shame to the family. And that's why, one of the reasons why the gospel is so revolutionary in the Middle East. But even more incredible And this is just so beautifully said in Romans 8. We're going to be in Romans 8 a little bit. In verse 15, it says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Oh my gosh. Like, I don't even, I can't even get my mind around that. Like we're heirs of the glory of God. We have the spirit in us that we can cry out, Abba, Father, to the creator of the universe. What is that? Do you guys even get that? Does anybody get it? I think Georgia gets it. 
I mean, I, it's like, it's unbelievable, right? But what does this have to say? What does this have to do with suffering? We'll read the next verse. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. We have this mindset that like God is going to fix all our problems. But what about the suffering? What is it in the suffering that we're supposed to share in? What is it that he wants to show us? I've found in my own life that suffering has greater power than anything else to teach me about what it means to be an adopted son of God greater power than anything else because we're told constantly in our culture about all of these different, all these different things that define who we are, right? If you have the right job, if you make enough money, if you have the best house, the, the, uh, so like social media is constantly telling us you need to have this thing to be happy. And most of these things aren't bad in and of, the, in and of themselves. But the point is that so often we find our identity in them if I look the right way to other people, these things, this is what defines our identity. And, with, and when we suffer, we realize that those things really aren't what matters. Those, re, those things are temporal. And this message of us being adopted children of God is what is going to last forever. There will be a day where we will be fully revealed as his children. So I want to share a little bit about our story. Um, I don't, I'm not doing this to make you guys feel bad or anything for us. Um, I really believe that the transformation that has happened um, in my life has largely been because of suffering and because I'm married to an awesome woman. I'll just say that. Sorry if you can't read it. Um, it's a little small. So we moved to Egypt in 2008, and for the first, like, two years, I was really, really sick. I had this chest infection thing, and then I had um, some digestive issues. I'll save you the details of that. Um, Just going through culture shock for two or three years, you basically feel worthless. You can't communicate anything. You get lost going to the grocery store, um, and you just feel like you have nothing to give, and that's very breaking. Um, My family, probably about, I think it was like six months in, uh, we found out Crystal's wife, or, oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Crystal's grandmother, <laughs> rewind there. Uh, Crystal's grandmother died suddenly. And that was, that was a tough blow for us. And then a couple months later, we found out that her dad had terminal cancer. Um, and so she left a little bit early to go spend some time with the family. I came with Jake in a little later. And my grandma had been in the hospital, and I could remember it so vividly. Jake and I were standing at the counter, checking in in Cairo. My sister calls me. She says, Grandma's not going to make it. Sure enough, my grandma died while we were on the way to San Diego to be with Crystal. Excuse me. We got there, spent some time, spent a few days with them, and I had to, come, I had to drive here to Paige to be at my grandma's funeral. We did the, spent one night, did the funeral, and a couple hours later, Crystal calls me, my dad just died. Had the kids with me, we loaded back up, drove the nine, nine hours back to San Diego. The biggest, the, one of the most painful things about this experience was I felt, I felt so alone. You know, I'm dealing with it in my way. I don't have anybody, like I just, nobody, I felt like nobody understood me. And I was like, God, what the heck, man? This, is, this isn't how it's supposed to be, right? This, this isn't what's supposed to happen. This is, and they were all sudden, all so shocking. Eventually, we went back to the field uh, later that summer. And in November, I think it was, our team leaders had us over to their house and said, we're leaving. And you guys have to be team leaders now. <laughs> After a tumultuous first, first year, right? Totally not prepared to be team leaders They're like, if you guys want to stay, you have to be team leaders. Well, all the people that joined wouldn't probably wouldn't have chose us as team leaders. And some of them we didn't wouldn't have chose. We just didn't really click. And some of they eventually, most of them eventually left, some the country, some to other teams. 
And we just felt. So eventually we faced the, went through the Egyptian revolution. I mean, it was just constant trial after trial. And so many times I was like, Lord, what are you doing? This is not how it's supposed to work out. Some other things that we faced, like we, we lost other family members, some by suicide. Um, we had relationship struggles. All of these things, the, one of the biggest things is it put so much strain on our marriage. We were at the point, honestly, where it was like, we're done. Like, if this is going to take out our marriage, we're not going to stay here. And we called some coaches and they were like, just wait. We'll get there within a week or two. They flew out and they counseled us and they helped us work through some of these things. And that was like the last straw. We were ready to, we were ready to just give up on this ministry Lots of unfulfilled hopes and dreams for the ministry that we had. We, we got to see some people come to faith and baptize some people and stuff like that. But not like we imagined when we left. Not like the dreams that we had. And now, praise God, someone is following Jesus that we prayed for constantly. Uh, my mom is still there. Some of you know my mom lived with us. And she's been following up with some of our relationships. And one thing now is, you know, like we're resettling back, to, back here to the States, and it's been hard. You guys are different. <laughs> it's not the same United States that we remember, right? And, and we got used to a different country and a different culture, and it's been hard to adjust. And things haven't always gone like I planned. It seems like a theme in my life, I guess. So if you're not going through suffering right now, you will. And I'm not speaking death. It's just how it is. And I hope that somehow what I have to share can empower you to cling to Jesus through it. So if you can read this, maybe. Um, what's your struggle? And maybe it's not even on this list. What is the, what is the fight that you're fighting right now? Or maybe you just, you just got through a battle and you're, you're weary and you're tired. If you, can, if you have a paper or if you just want to put it in your mind, what, I mean, I'm sure you guys know. You probably don't need to write it down. What is it that I'm fighting right now? And I just want to say, this is where I put abuse on this list. I just, want to, I just felt like I needed to put this up there and say it. I don't want to make light of it. If any of you, if this is something that somebody is suffering from, please seek out Pastor Manny or Al or anybody else or someone in the community that can walk through that with you. So, in, in, as we continue on in Romans 8, it talks about the groaning, the groaning of all creation, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And it goes on and it talks about how we, even though we have hope, even though we have this Holy Spirit, we inwardly groan right? And sometimes when we're going through these trials, we groan and we complain. And a lot of times we don't talk to anybody. We don't, we don't open up to other people. We don't even really open up to God, even though he knows everything. We just kind of hold it in. And sometimes that leads, okay, this, let me go back to this. I forgot I wanted to say this. This is the, this is the hardest part of our suffering. This quote the despair of the sufferer is not caused by the depth of the suffering, but by the depth of his sense of separation from God. In the midst of our suffering, we feel like, I can't even talk to God. Like, he's not listening. Where, where is he in the midst of this pain and this hardship? And we're groaning. And sometimes, because we hold our groaning in and shove it aside and you know, say some cliche that maybe makes it feel better for a little bit. Sorry. We end up, like we end up doing things that aren't helpful, for us, helpful to us. We end up falling into sin. We end up living lives that aren't loving. Sometimes when we, we even feel this way, right? It's my fault. I was stupid, right? God can't be there for me. I'm the, I'm the reason that we, I have this problem. 
And sometimes that's true. Sometimes it is very, very true that we are the cause of some of our suffering. And sometimes the pain of that groaning and us holding it in, like I was saying, it leads to addiction. It leads to us separating ourselves from people. It leads to us relying on our, on our, on our own strength. It leads to us living in anger and frustration. It leads to us having constant fear and desire to control our lives. It leads to us wanting revenge over other people even. It leads to us living in unforgiveness or resentment, maybe even of God, or maybe even being and feeling entitled. And this was a big one for me. So here we are back in the States and I have this plan and it seemed really good. And this is how it was supposed to work out. It's not working out that way, God. Don't you remember I spent like over a decade in the Middle East Don't you remember all this stuff that I did? Wow. And I felt like he was supposed to do something special for me because, and he was supposed to fix my plan and follow my plan and way of doing things because of something that I felt, some points that I had earned or something. And then I finally realized that's really, it's really not the case. And I'm not trying to bring condemnation into your guys' lives. I'm not trying to say, oh, you guys are bad and all this kind of stuff. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes these patterns that we fall into, most of the time they're evidence of something deeper going on in our heart. There's, There's an emptiness. There's an aching. Tanner was talking about this morning. There's seeds that have been planted in our, in our hearts deep down. And there's weeds and there's bad fruit coming out of those things. And that Jesus wants to get down into that place in your soul and heal that, that place. And yeah, he does want you to turn away from sin too, but it comes from a deeper place. And sometimes we use these things to numb, to numb the pain that he's trying to heal. So I want to use Jesus. I know it's not really fair to use Jesus as an example always. because he's perfect, right? And we just feel unable to meet up to him. But you guys know, I mean, we quote this, we quote this for, this is another thing we quote all the time. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness is verse 26, Romans 8. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words, And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Talk about this is how I fight my battles. Like, I don't even know what to say. And then the Holy Spirit kind of does this thing for me, and and the Father understands, and and he works it out. I mean, that's like, that doesn't seem like good theology, does it? That's crazy to me. Even when I don't know what to pray, he's working for me. So here's Jesus. Yeah, I'm getting like all mixed up. I'm getting ahead of myself. Later on, after this passage, it says, or after this little section I just read, another verse we always quote. For we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are and are called according to his purpose for them. Right? Don't we love to quote this verse? When somebody's going through a hard time, you quote this verse, right? I got them. They're going through this hard time, and I quoted, I quoted this scripture to them, man, made it all better. I've been on the receiving end, and I just want to slap them. I'm like, I don't care. This this hurts right now. It's not getting worked out. Right? That's how that's how I feel. And maybe I'm yeah, maybe I just struggle more than the rest of you guys. Well, what's the next verse say? 
For God knew his people in advance. And he chose them to become, to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Having everything always worked out doesn't just mean having your problems fixed. God causes all things to work together, including you, including you, working you into the image of Jesus. I believe some, most of the time, Jesus cares more about me being in his image than he does about a little trial that I'm facing. And that's a hard word. That's hard for me to hear. No, you're supposed to fix my problems, God. And he's like, you know what? I want you to look like me. I want you to be able to love people like I love people. So here we have Jesus. Finally, I, this is like the third time I said that. <laughs> we have Jesus in the middle of the Garden of Gethsemane. He's like about to face the most difficult trial that he's ever faced. And what does he say? What does he say? Anybody? Huh? He prayed and he said, take this cup from me. This is Jesus. He shouldn't say like, Lord, I don't want to do this. Right? But then he still said, but not my will. And I really believe this is, this was, this is how Jesus lived. He knew that he, that the father was going to take care of him no matter what. He knew that he could go through any hellish, horrible trial and that Jesus would, that, that the father would be there with him, watching over him. And this isn't just about Jesus dying to save the world, you guys. Remember, we must suffer with him. We are also the children of God, that God, the, the father wants to display his glory through us as we suffer just like he did through Jesus. Somehow in the midst of our suffering, we think that God doesn't really love us or somehow we forget. I, so we're, we're trying to figure out where we're going to live. And, <laughs> and how, how, where are we going to rent? Are we going to buy? Are we going to build? All this stuff. I call my dad. A lot of you guys know my dad. And I'm like so frustrated. I'm like... I don't know what to do, Dad. This is horrible. And he's, he lets me go on and on for a few minutes. And he's like, you remember I know how to build houses, right? <laughs> you remember, like, we've done a little bit of concrete together. I mean, that's how stupid I, like, <laughs> that's how ridiculous I am sometimes. And it's the same thing with God. And I had this, after that conversation, I had this realization and the Lord was like, either I have this figured out or I'm not real. You believe in me. You say you believe in me. There's nothing in between. And I know it sounds like another cliche, but there's, no, there's nothing in between. Either he has it figured out and he has a purpose in your suffering or he's not real. Like there's nothing in between there. And I hope that somehow we can, we can raise the level of the importance of our Christ-likeness above our suffering. That we are okay with, suffer, with going through difficult times because we really deep down, we want to look like Jesus. I hope that's me. I hope that's my, my true heart cry. Because it results in the way that Jesus interacted with people around him. Even before he, Jesus suffered ridicule and questioning when he would go and perform miracles among the people who were the, the most, the, the outcasts of society, right? People would ridicule him. But he didn't care because he was rooted in the fact that he was a child, that he was the son of God. His identity and his security in the eternal, everlasting Father was everything. It was the perfect foundation. You guys know that most of his healings, if you, if you look at all of his healings and you think about the Jewish culture at the time, 
he, the people that he healed were the people who, like, you're not supposed to touch. Lepers and the woman with the issue of blood, all these people who are like, in their culture, would defile you. Those are the people that Jesus went to. He didn't care what their background was. He didn't care what they'd been through. He didn't care that if the suffering that they were going through was because of them or not. And that's something that I, I have this realization when I'm, you know, that sign is going through my head. Yeah, you made a stupid decision. It's your fault. He doesn't care. He's still there wanting to walk through the trial with you, even if it's your fault. And that's the amazing grace that is in him. It makes us relatable. And this is what's so valuable, you guys. There's this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I'm not sure God wants us to be happy. I think he wants us to love and be loved. But we are like children, thinking our toys will make us happy and the world is our nursery. This guy's British, so nursery is, you know, your playroom. Something must drive us out of that nursery and into the lives of others, and that thing is suffering. This is, man, when I read this one day, it just blew my mind. How much, ab- how much more able are you to, to relate to people and be with them in the midst of their trials when you have faced suffering and gone through it and presented it to God and dealt with it in a healthy way? And so I want to move on to the idea of victory. I'll give you the answer if I go too far ahead. What shall we say? Okay, so it's all these awesome, all it talks about all this awesome stuff about what it's like to be children of God, how amazing that is. And Paul says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Okay, I'm going to skip down. I'm going to skip a few verses, and then I'll go back. There's this verse that we always quote, another one. Let me find it here. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Okay, so we're typical pattern, right? We're going through a trial. I'm trying to figure out where, I'm, where my family's going to live. And I'm having these feelings of like the American dream and the American definition of a man is that I'm supposed to have this property and it's supposed to look this way. And if it doesn't look that way, then the people around me are going to be like, you're mooching off of family, you're living with family, or you're not fitting the bill of what it's supposed to be like to be a man in in the United States. And I have my plan that I've been thinking about for months and it's not working out. Victory means having all that stuff fixed, right? Victory means having all those problems and have done with and having it be easy. I don't believe that's the case. Yeah, Jesus, he comes in and he fixes problems. He can and he does and he might, but he doesn't always fix the problem. He usually doesn't fix it in the way that we think it should be fixed. So if you back up, so we have this, we still always have this mindset. I'm a, I'm a conqueror. I'm victorious. I'm going to beat this thing. I'm not going to have this problem anymore. I'm not going to have this financial struggle or this relationship struggle or whatever it is. But verse 37, it starts with the word no. And we, it starts with the word no because there was a question that was asked. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, no. And what does he say after that? Despite all these things, you're gonna fix your, we're gonna, I'm gonna fix your problems? Despite all these problems, you're victorious and I'm gonna fix your problems? It says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. It says nothing about the problem being fixed. It says nothing about the suffering going away. And I believe, I've, I've seen people healed. I, it's not that I don't believe that God can take sickness away. He does. But I want to ask you guys some questions as you think about the suffering that you're facing right now. Or maybe you can ask these questions if you do face suffering down the road. What if victory is knowing the love of Jesus more deeply in your life? What if that's it? Is that enough? What if victory is understanding your place as a dearly loved and liked child of God? Is that enough? Would you be willing to go through your suffering continually for the rest of your life if it meant knowing Jesus better? I don't know if I could say yes, but I've tried. I don't want to go through the suffering that we faced over the last several years again. I would love to have our family members back and not have to remember that pain. But then I think about the transformation that he's brought into my life and the way that I get a message from somebody whose child has died or dad is going to die or something, and I cry. And I'm like, Lord, what is this? He's like, I'm making you relatable. I'm making it easier for you to understand the suffering of other people. What if the amount of greatness that he will produce in and through your life from this trial will totally eclipse the pain? And this is a big one, you guys. There's people that are suffering all around our communities in Page, in Flagstaff, all around the state. Is there someone out there in your town, in your school, in your work? They're waiting for you to get your healing. They're waiting for you to know Jesus more deeply in that place so that you can help them get their healing. So that you can reach out to them and say, you know what, I get it, I understand, I've been there, I'm here with you. If there's anybody here that, um, that doesn't know Jesus or you're not sure, I'm not, I think it's obvious, I'm not going to tell you that he's going to fix all your problems. But I can attest to this community, this, this church, that there are people here that will come alongside you and hold your hand. And that there is a father that is, wants to come alongside you and hold your hand. There's a deep place where you're like, Lord, I, I can't trust you with this thing. Just take a step. There's people throughout, and I, I, know, a few, I know a few things that, have, that people in this church have been struggling with recently. There's people here that understand you and love you. And they want to be here for you. And there's some of you that have been through suffering and you know a deep, you, you have this deep place with Jesus and you're able, and I just want to call you guys to step out. I want to call you guys to step out and embrace those people that are struggling. So I, I just want to pray, and then I'm going to, I'm going to play a song. And during the song, I just, yeah, I invite you to put whatever it is that you need to put before Jesus. To know that he is there with you in the midst of the suffering 
and that he is going to work all things out. That he is going to make you more like him. And that's the most beautiful thing. It's far more beautiful than anything of this world. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we are your children. I thank you that you love us so dearly, far, far more than we could ever imagine. I thank you that you're forming us and you're shaping us and creating us to be in the image of Jesus. That there are broken and hurting people in our communities and around the world that are waiting for us to know the depths of your love and our, in our suffering so that we can, we can reach out to them and be there with them and lead them to you. And so I ask that you would help us to, to remain in that place of your love and be willing to, to count it all joy as we, say, as we face trials of many kinds. Because we know that our, our faith is going to be made perfect. And we know, we know that we will come out on the other side looking like Jesus. If there's anyone, Lord, that specially needs your touch today, I just ask that you would speak clearly to them now or after church or whatever it is, Lord. You would just take us to that next level of understanding your embrace in the midst of suffering, Lord. In Jesus' name. I think that's one of the best messages that's come out of this house in years. If you look at the story of every disciple, they were shredded, they were crushed. Um, every person I know that really walks this life goes through hardship. You know, we, and, and, and I'm not going to blame it on the church I grew up in, but for some reason I came away from salvation that we live happily ever after, but that's a fairy tale. That's nowhere in the Bible. And so, you know, it's so important for us because so many people try to use faith as, faith as, as this escape button from hardship. That's not the escape button. Faith is holding on to Jesus that we will walk through this hardship together because the hardest thing when we're suffering is to believe that God is with us. We feel so alone. And what's really sad is when the church acts like there's something wrong with you because you're in pain and suffering and, and acts like you don't have enough faith, uh, I think we're denying the truth of Scripture. And so I think it's so important and I mean, the message stands on its own, but I wanted to follow that up to tell you that this is God's truth. And going and denying it isn't going to change that it's God's truth so that we can be here for each other and love each other through the hardship and not act like for some reason there's something wrong with you because you're in pain. These are the quiet messages. You don't get the amen corner going with these messages. But that's all right. It's still the truth. And so I just want to follow up Scott's prayer, and, and I wanted to follow up to say, this is truth. Accept it. Believe it. It's biblical. And so, Father, now as we leave, I pray that every heart would be open to receive what came really from you. Scott was just a conduit. And had the courage to speak the message you put on his heart. Lord God, I pray we would have the courage to accept the truth as you've prevent, sit, presented it. And in so doing, Lord God, that we would be made more like you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you give Scott a thanks for his courage. I pray God blesses you all. I hope you have a great week.